Welcome to today's History Upper Ohio Valley. I'm your host, Bob Connors, and we're going to talk to pets today. We're going to kind of have a party. Can I say that? <laughs> there we go. We have a party. And I'd like my guests to introduce themselves to help us find out who we're talking about here. I'm Julie Larish of Belmont County Hoof and Paw. And I'm Jordan Costello with Belmont County Hoof and Paw. So let's start with um, what do you do? What what is, What is... Uh, Belmont County Hoof and Paw. What we you? are a, a newly developed um, humane agency. We are organized under the AORC 1717, mm -hmm. um, which basically says we're here for the protection of animals. Um, we, we have several humane agents now that have gone through the Ohio training, mm -hmm. and we go out and we try to protect animals as best <clears throat> we can. Well, that's good. Um, also, uh, what exactly on a daily day basis does what do you do what how do you how does it happen how does the organization what does it do if you said this is what our organization does what is it well our organization like she said we are a humane organization we are there to not only promote humane um, treatment of animals but also educate people on mm -hmm. the humane treatment of animals um, as well as work with other agencies should we get a call things like that mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's basically doing what's best for all the animals whenever we do get a call. Well, that's good. So apparently there are all kinds of animals you have to deal with. Uh, do you work closely with all the, the animal shelters in the area? Or? Um, we do a lot of networking, uh, not just with um, within our own um, area. We do, if we have some specialty, like wildlife, we even go as far as Columbus and Zanesville. Uh, we work a lot with the cat organizations. Um, starting with Nine Lives Matters, uh, Belmont County uh, Humane Society through uh, Angela Hatfield with the Cat Shun Program through Andis Fleegan. Um, we work, we are willing to work with uh, um, the, the dog shelter if they have a space available for us. Um, and then we also network without or and into other organizations that can help us place animals um, in great homes and give them a better life. Well, that's great. Now, I understand you're both um humane officers yes is that correct can you talk about what that means what do you do as a humane officer yes as a humane officer uh, we take the calls um, it was a lot of times we get them from the law enforcement agencies they've got a situation where we've got some animal abuse animal cruelty or um, neglect um, sometimes it's, it's, it's a call just to check on a well-being um, we as humane agents are uh, ordained by the judge and and through the Belmont County mm -hmm. And we go out and we assess the situation. Uh, if necessary, get a search warrant, act as a law. We are actually a law enforcement agent or a, an officer. Well, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. And so what we do um, is a lot of times we will work directly with the Belmont County Sheriff's Department to have one of them accompany us in certain situations. Um, we assess it. We decide whether it's a, a viable, yes, it is a humane issue. If it's not a humane issue, does it go to another organizations such as a dog at large uh, would go to the shelter. Um, we would call the shelter and say, hey, we have this dog running loose or we've captured a dog that runs loose. Um, so we go in, we basically look and see, is, is this something that we need to take care of and are they doing anything illegal? And if they are, we work with the prosecutors to make sure that they get what, what they deserve um, and that we can actually help people. Well, one of the things that I've noticed um, that really drives me insane. People leave animals in abandoned homes and the animals starve to death. Could you talk to that, how much that happens and what someone would do if they noticed that that happened in a neighborhood, they know a house with a pet in it, what should they do, who should they contact? Um, that is a common occurrence in the area, um, especially for somebody who disappears in the middle of the night or they, they seem to just dis up and disappear altogether. Um, if you uh, have a house next to you that you notice that there are animals and the next day the tenants are gone or the next couple of days the tenants are watch for those animals to make sure if you hear them barking, if you hear them in the house, whatever. And then at that time, call the humane agency um, so that we can get in there and we can take care of the animals. Abandoning animals is against the law. Uh, that is a form of cruelty. So uh, what we would do is we would then track down who the tenants were and try to um, assess as, as much as possible. The main thing is to get the animals out. So if 
you see some animals and the people have disappeared, make sure you're, you're checking to see if those animals are there. Well, I, th I think that's a good thing because like <clears throat> dogs will bark, cats can't. They might, get, they might go to the window or look for somebody. Right. They might do something like that. But if I were in that situation, who would I call? Who, who, what would I look for? Um, there's a couple different ways that you <clears throat> could, you could call. Um, you can call us direct. Um, we we will give you our number. They can call us direct. They can you know they can link us onto Facebook. If you if you're not comfortable calling us, go to our Facebook page. Send us a message. We'll check it out. What is the name of your Facebook page? Uh, it's Belmont County Hoof and Paw. Belmont County Hoof, Hoof and, and Paw. Paw. Or you can put B C H P in there, and it will also bring up Belmont County Hoof and Paw. B C H P. Yes. BCHP. And, and, while we're at it, how about if we give them the phone number so we... Yes. Uh, you guys know the number off hand? Yes. Off -hand? Yeah. Yes. It's uh, area code 610-314-5203. And that is my direct line. So they, uh, I've got it on me 24-7. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if, if they call that number or they notify us via Facebook or... Um, they can also email us at uh, bchp911 at gmail. Uh, any form like that, or if necessary, call the Belmont County Sheriff's Department, and then they will send us the call. Um, same way with any of the local law enforcement, where we're very familiar with working with Martins Ferry, uh, Bethesda. Um, they can call any other law enforcement agency and say, hey, we need the humane agent out here, and uh, we would be more than happy to show up. So they could just call their local police department or the county sheriff and yes. say, this is what we need, <clears throat> and they would refer you over to that address. Yes, yes. Well, I think that's pretty valuable information for people to have, because I know that is happening, disgusting as it is. <laughs> yes, it's disgusting as it is. And, and the thing is, especially with, um, you know, there's a lot of people who get animals and then all of a sudden they can't take care of them or they don't want to take care of them and then they get a move and they're like, I can't move in, into this new place without with a dog, so I'll just leave the dog here. Somebody will get it. Well, not that doesn't always happen. Not not yeah. everybody knows. So if you do have somebody who has recently moved out, please, whatever you do, look for animals, look for dogs, cats, even you know, if you hear something unusual in the house, have the law enforcement come out and check out the house. It could be we've got snakes, we've got rabbits, we've got, you know, guinea pigs, we've got other things in cages, birds, anything like that. So if they're hearing something in the house, let law enforcement know. They can at least check out the house. Well, that's, uh, that's good to know. That really is good to know. Um, what, what is the most common thing you run into? Cats. Cats. <laughs> cats, cats. Cats overpopulating, cats running at large. Um, cats are the biggest issue. Um, like she said earlier, they breed most uh, prevalently and prolifically um, up to three to four times in a year. So, um, wow. yes, they have they, lots of cat issues. One cat can end up having, at the max, 40 kittens within a year. So if you take those 40 kittens and you times it by 10 again, the next year we've got 400 kittens. Um, cats are the big thing. If it's feral cats or cats outside, we work in conjunction with a lot of spay, trap, and neuter and release. Uh, what's very important to understand is when you spay, trap, and neuter, you want them released back into the same area only because they're not going to repopulate. And they're going to be territorial to where this is my place. I'm not letting another cat come in because those other cats that are coming in are not spayed or neutered. Mm. So now you're starting the population over again. So um, there is a whole scientific realm around the spay, trap, neuter program. And we have some really good agencies out there that do that here in the, in the Belmont County area. Well, that's good to know because feral cats, uh, that is a big, a big issue. Yes, I mean, yes. I, I, Cats are probably the most prevalent issue we've dealt with, and then starving dogs. People putting dogs on chains, putting them outside, not making sure they have food and water uh, multiple times, especially in the cold weather, um, making sure they have warm water, they have food, and they're in an appropriate box. Um, sometimes we roll up on a scene and there's a nice big box but the hole for the dog to get in and out does not fit the size of the dog. Oh so you've got a good box, but you just can't get the dog in it. Uh, or we could have an oversized dog in this little itty bitty box that's plastic and is not insulated and doesn't have any straw in it for it. And therefore, you might as well just leave it out in the weather because the only thing you're doing is breaking the wind. 
Yeah, that, uh, that would just be horrible to do to a dog. Yes, it, it is. It, would. it is. And there's some breeds of dogs that you don't want outside, mm -hmm. like a boxer, for instance. You don't want it outside. It, has, it does not have the means to keep warm because it's short-haired. Your short-haired dogs, um, you, you don't want them outside at all. Now, there's other dogs, like your huskies, that they don't want to be inside. You know, they want to be out in the cold. That's what they're, that's what they're built for. They have multiple layers to them. Uh, they would actually overheat inside of a house, uh, putting them in, but on extreme bad weather, you want to put them inside a garage or something yeah. that they can at least get out of the weather. Um, with these dogs that are outside like that, if, if you, someone sees it or if, if they have a problem, for example, with their own dog that they're going to abandon or they don't know what to do with it, can they call you and get some help? Because yes, they, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, they can give us a call for anything like that. Also, um, don't be afraid to call if you're in question. If you if you wonder, is this happening or is it not? I'd rather be safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. If it's not happening and we roll up on the scene and we look and say, yeah, everything checks out, that's fine. I would rather check it out than the opposite. We don't check it out and, and the dog ends and up dead. Something happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't we don't want to do that. So yeah, we definitely want those calls. The other thing that we have worked very close with um, Columbus Humane and getting some donations for food. So if you know if you see a dog that is starving or if you yourself cannot um, you, everybody goes through hard times. If you're in a hard time and it's like okay, do my children eat or do my dog eat? Um, if you need dog food, as long as we let have the supplies, know. we'll be happy to help. Is that? Yeah. Said, let us know. Yeah, sure. let us know. And there's a, there's a situation, I think, where sometimes people have a pet and, and they're doing the right thing with that pet and then they have to move for whatever reason to a, an apartment where they're not allowed to take their pet. So those would be people who would call you and say, well, I can't take my yes. animal anymore and they can get some help. Yeah, they could, they could get some help. In a lot of instances, um, I know a lot of people, when they hear dog pound, they have a negative, a negative aspect of it. Um, the Bella County Animal Shelter is a, pretty much a no-kill shelter. The only time they would euthanize is in a medical emergency or a very, very, very vicious dog that nobody can handle. Uh, Belmont County Animal Shelter will take in dogs and rehome them. There are other rescues, the Road Home Project, uh, they're really good about taking in, you know, dogs that the, they need to get rid of because they're moving or, and it breaks the owner's hearts. I mean, it's not an easy thing. Um, Road Home Project is awesome for taking in those dogs, rehabbing them and getting them into new homes. There, there is a whole list of, of people out there and we're continuing as a young group putting our resource guide together so we can, you know, get them. We have Adobe Rescue we work with, an Aussie Rescue we work yeah. with, you know, getting those into those specific things. So yeah. feel free to call us when you have a dog that you need to have rehomed. What would someone do if they wanted to join your organization and help? Because I know you rely on volunteer work a lot. So what would someone do who wants to be a part of this? Um, get in contact with us. We have an application to fill out. Um, and then we have, um, multi we have several groups in our, in, within our group. Um, we are 100% volunteer. We have the only funding we get is uh, donations at this point in time. Um, the, the county has, has um, so much money they can give and they gave it to another organization that is another humane agency, which is great. Um, we came on the back end because we were young. Um, so we're 100% volunteers. Everybody's volunteers. Nobody gets paid. Um, sometimes we pay out of our pocket for, for you know, food, <laughs> yeah. vetting, things like that. I mean, that, that this just goes with the territory. But the, yeah, just get, get a hold of us and we'll be happy to give them an application, set them up. We have, um, last night I did our roster because we had a few people leave and a few people come. Uh, we are now up to 26 members. Wow, that's pretty, um, so, that's and some of our members uh, are not always at our meeting, but our members are there. Like when I have a, a big call, uh, a lot of cattle, a lot of horses, whatever we got to get. If I make that call, I have four or five trailers lined up and several big guys to help me manage, you know, a 1,200 pound animal. So, um, yeah, if, and if you have a specialty, like my specialty is horses. I have another friend who's special, two, two friends, their specialties are cattle. Uh, Jordan here is a zoologist and her specialty is wildlife and um, the reptiles small and the animals, small animals. <laughs> so, you know, if you have a, if somebody has a specialty in the type of animal, we would love to have them on board because yeah. the more we share our knowledge, 
the better off we become as humane agencies. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Now, uh, since you would definitely need some funds, how would people donate to you? Would they go to your Facebook page? How would they do that? They can go to our Facebook page. We also have a new website. It's bchp911.com. You can donate through there. Um, you can give us a call, um, and we can give you um, actually our mailing address for um, our agency. Um, our our treasurer um, is six four zero zero five Garrett Hill Road, St. Clairsville, um, and four three nine five zero. But we, if you call us, we can give that information out, and that way, if anybody wants to send a check. We can have it sent directly to. Well, I hope our that treasure. some people do send a check. <laughs> it would be nice. Uh, it would be nice. We're trying very hard. We are having a spaghetti dinner coming up, uh, February fifteenth at the Barnesville Senior Center, and that's going to raise some funds. And we're in the process of putting together a uh, night at the races to try to raise as much money as possible. Uh, we just had a tattoo uh, fundraiser down at Kovacs mm -hmm. Tattoo, and we raised some awesome funds that really at that given time was dire needs to, to yeah. pay some vet bills. Our biggest expense, besides the food, um, our biggest expense is, is vet bills. I would yeah. imagine that would be a big deal. Yes. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, just that we need all the help we can get. Um, we are open to suggestions if people have uh, anything they need information on or, or that they see that we need to do better. We're, we're, we're welcome to constructive criticism. We don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. We're a new group. Um, we are working very closely with our prosecutors on a lot of our cases. And, and I know sometimes people just wish we could run in and take animals. Yeah. We can't do that. We have to do it by the letter of the law, uh, especially a case that, you know, is severe. And we want to make sure our, everything's taken care of and everything's getting done. Um, okay. Well, hey, thank you for coming in. Thank you. We well, appreciate it. And thank you. And thank this little cute little guy. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Teddy, thank we got you. It. Come on, say okay. He said thank you. Teddy's a rescue. <laughs> so, yep. This has been today's History Upper Ohio Valley. I'm your host, Bob Connors, and we will see you next time. Welcome to today's History Upper Ohio Valley. I'm your host, Bob Connors, and we are going to have a wonderful conversation about something that affects everybody in the country, no matter where you live, including here in St. Clairsville and any other town, because we have a really surprise. It's not Santa Claus, but, but almost, <laughs> almost as distant, smaller. because you don't get to see him very often, but he's around all the time. Tom Murphy. Uh, city, Bob, thank you very much for having me. Yes. City Planning and Zoning Administration. Yes, Administrator. yes. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that I had some experience of not knowing anything about planning. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and many of us don't, really. We don't know what you do or what happens, and I think maybe we can discuss a little bit about yeah, we those can, things. And we can definitely discuss that. I've been with the city of St. Clairsville for uh, 18 years now, and love St. Clairsville. It's a great community. Uh, sometimes, I, no community is perfect, but sometimes we forget uh, how nice our city is. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we have a lot going for us, and that's a good thing. There's always room for improvement. Um, but what I do is I handle a lot of the new development, uh, new construction. Uh, for example, in a small town like St. Clairsville, you may not have massive uh, businesses and huge businesses moving in. Uh, but as far as the downtown district where we are right now, uh, there was a Pizza Milano just opened up here within the past month. The owner of that structure bought it, rehabbed it, uh, put well over... I think six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars into the structure uh, to wow. make it vital to our downtown, and they have some apartments on the top of it. So we also have a residential aspect to that too. Um, we have on the east side of town the St. Clair Commons development, which uh, sometimes uh, I'll hear people refer to that roadway that connects to the mall area as the road to nowhere, mm -hmm. and that frustrates me because that property was totally landlocked, right. and so now we've opened that up. It'll take time, but. Uh, there is a senior living facility out there now, and uh, the long-term goal, whether it's five or ten years, something will happen out there. And uh, that'll bring jobs, which is good for our community and also for the younger people of the, the town as well. Yeah, that kind of gets to my next question, that is, that's what you do. I think it'd be important for the folks to understand why what you do is important. Uh, yeah, a lot of planning, uh, you look at different land use and you try to make sure that it's in certain parts of your community. You wouldn't want to 
industrial use right in the middle of residential. So you have different residential zoning districts. That protects your property value. Uh, that ensures that, hey, we're not going to uh, lose residents because an industrial use moved right into that uh, neighborhood. That's not going to happen. So it helps protect property values. Uh, and by uh, having different zoning districts, commercial especially, in areas of the city that are growing, like St. Clair Commons area, uh, it's zoned for in a certain way that it'll bring offices, it'll bring, bring commercial, it'll bring jobs. Mm -hmm. And again, that's only good for everybody in the Ohio Valley. Yeah, um, with that lead that we're talking about right now, so I hear sometimes people say things like, well, I, I can't get to work. I need something close to my house. Would you just talk to why, <laughs> sort, it goes along with what you're saying, why we can't have all the employment right next to your house. Right, yeah. You. Uh, it would kind of, years ago you had that, you know, you had the factory right at, along the riverside and the people lived all along up on the hillside on the smaller lots and that was great. Now people's ideas change and uh, we were driving a lot more now, uh, but they also don't want to live in those smaller lots. Um, so you don't have as that mass of a population that can inhabit those areas. Many of them have moved out. And uh, we've had a decline in industry in the Ohio Valley, but that doesn't mean things can't come back and we still can't have a vital area. Yeah. So, so why is zoning important to the city in general? Uh, I'll use maybe the example of the downtown district. Um, <clears throat> back in the 80s, I wasn't here at the time, uh, but I've seen older pictures. And downtown St. Clairsville, uh, as far as the look of it, uh, it was, uh, I'd say, a little dated. Uh, and when I say that, I mean it was in the 1970s, it was a, a lot of facades were covered up, and there's just beautiful facades here in St. Clairsville. So during the 80s and 90s, uh, things changed, and, uh, you know, a streetscape was put in. Uh, you had uh, you know, many of the commercial uses moved out, but in many respects we were lucky because attorneys moved in, purchased the structures, uh, helped rehab them. They had the finances. I'd love to see more of a retail and commercial aspect. And the market will dictate that. Um, we'll, we've had some that have moved in, um, and hopefully we can have more. But that zoning, it, it ensures that, hey, this is where the commercial development's going to take place. It's not going to bleed into a neighborhood and, you know, in an old house that you really shouldn't have a business. Someone moves a business in, they don't have anywhere to park. It's just a, can, creates a lot of problems. So we kind of earmark and try to keep things into downtown district or our other commercial districts. You know, that kind of goes to my next thought is, is, how does that help a city to grow? And part of my question is, um, so that the folks can understand what you're doing, is how does it affect them? And I, you touched on it a minute ago, somebody runs, plops a business up next to your house, there's a parking problem. Uh, do you, can you talk to that a little bit about the problems that can come up with you? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, one great example is, is along East Main Street, once you leave the downtown district, heading toward the mall, I'll say. Uh, many years ago, there was no one enforced the zoning ordinance, and I guess one of the big complaints at that time was you had businesses moving into these older homes. No one was there to say, hey, you can't do that. Uh, and they might have 10, 15 employees, and although the majority of East Main Street there is uh, residential, uh, you had a lot of congestion, people taking other people's, what they thought were their parking places. Mm -hmm. And just with that, there wasn't any planned expansion. Like say, okay, a, an office would be good here because you have a backyard that's conducive to an appropriate parking lot. And those employees and, and uh, customers can get off the street and not create that congestion. So there are yes. some lots that are conducive to that and many that might not be. So basically what I hear you saying is by good planning, you avoid chaos in every neighborhood right. with no people having businesses next door, something, maybe noise, whatever. That's a big part of what you do. Right, and, and I always recommend to people, you know, St. Clairsville does a good job at planning. Uh, again, no community's perfect, but you can hop on 40 and head, uh, whether east or west, and anybody can kind of get an idea of where there is no planning. There's no sign guidelines, uh, there's no parking guidelines, and, and it detracts very often from the community where you could have seen something develop there commercially in a positive way. It ended up, because there were no guidelines at all, uh, developed in a negative way, which really hurts the property values of those adjacent to it. So, yeah, so that's a direct um, situation that affects everybody in town. Yes. Every mm -hmm. single homeowner. Every, exactly right. Everybody. You have to look at the big picture because um, if you make a mistake here, 
the person over here is going to say, well, why'd you let them do that? And that's never a good thing. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. 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 Well, um, now the next thing we'd like to have you talk about a little bit is the census. Definitely. And uh, if you could explain why is that important that it happens and why folks should should complete the census forms and do what they need to do. Yeah, and it's it's really an easy process, and it's become even easier now that uh, computers are, you know, every I can't say everybody uses them, but they're so important. The main goal of the census is to count everyone uh, in the country, every resident of the country. Are you going to do that? No, you're never going to get catch everyone, but... Uh, it gives us an idea of how we're growing. Um, the results of that census, uh, it, it determines the number of representatives that each state will have in the House of Representatives. So the more people you have, the more representation you have. And in our government, that's an important thing. Also, the population of each state, city, or place name, or municipality, uh, that determines where more than $670 million of fed your federal funds, your tax dollars, will be spent. So uh, if your thought is, hey, I don't want the government to know, well, that hurts you in the long run. Uh, you want to be able to, those funds go toward uh, education, they go toward our roads, our highways, uh, our state routes, um, uh, various types of education programs, health care. So it's really important. It affects us. It affects everybody. Yes. Uh, can you speak just a little bit more about the uh, representation? I'm not so sure that we all understand why how we get represent representation. <laughs> yeah, and I actually can't speak very intelligently about that. Um, I do know that uh, Ohio has the chance of losing a seat in the House of Representatives, which is never a good thing. Uh, and that's another reason why, hey, get out there. You know, when, when you get the notice to fill out the census forms, do it. Um, if another state happens to have a poor uh, poor, or very few number that respond or lower than us, you know, hey, Ohio, get out there, uh, fill out that census form. So, Yeah, that, uh, that's one of the things that, I, that is important to me yeah. because I understand our representation for in Congress. We may lo well lose a congressman and people might say, well, gee, what does that have to do with me? And I think very important. It, what it really has to do with them and they don't understand is instead of having whatever we have, what do we have now? Uh, we used to have 20, and I think we're down to 12 or 13 yeah, it now. Could be. I'm not it's somewhere in that area. But when we lose one, that means there's one less guy in, in Washington arguing for things that you need to have happen here in Ohio. Right, and then their representation then is spread out. The fewer number you have, the more that that person that's elected for your region, I'll say, um, they might be for from I think our currently we're all the our area is rough well along the river more so is all the way from Marietta up to uh, East Liverpool or something how are they going to know what's going on in St. Clairsville or Bel Air or, you know, they just get they get spread thin and they can't yeah. properly represent your area well that's a good point because if you lose one that means that they all have to split that distance that, that exactly. difference up yep. so you're going to have even less representation all across the state of Ohio because one guy's gone right Yep, and uh, they're not going to be as familiar with your area. They might, if they're, if, say, for example, in the next uh, election, uh, our area, St. Clairsville, the person is uh, from Dover or some other area, they might be familiar with St. Clairsville, but they're always going to represent their area better than yours. It's not their fault. It's just human nature. Yeah, so. yeah. and that would be, you know, it's, uh, and I, I can almost hear some people saying, well, it doesn't matter. They just spend money anyway. Well, yeah. <laughs> just imagine this is the way I see it, is the fewer of them we have, the more other people in Montana, Wyoming, right. Nevada, they get to spend more money. You're and exactly it's your right. money they're spending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want your guy there or do you want the Montana guy? Right. If your state has 50 vo voices compared to in Congress only compared to 10, you know, obviously the ones with uh, the 50 voices are going to be able to uh, pool their re resources and kind of get some more fun funds going their way. So yeah, exactly, California has state. 55. Yeah, they had I think the most representatives. <laughs> they yeah. do, they yeah. do. So it's very important that people fill out the census. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, very important. What I and what I see in this area is is jobs. You know, the concern is always the younger people that are leaving the area, and that's not uh, only for us. There's other areas that are the same way, and 
you know, these businesses will look at the number of people in your area. They will want you to, let's see, if we move there, you know, is there the type of person we're looking for to work in our job, you know, whatever, whether it's office work, industrial work, um, they're going to look at those statistics. Retail businesses look at those statistics. Uh, some of the interesting things I was able to Interesting things I was able to find out about St. Clairsville, and I encourage anybody, not just St. Clairsville, Belmont County residents, was that uh, what our low response rate, and what that is, is St. Clairsville, the city of, our two census tracts, the low response rate was 15%. In other words, 15% of the residential uh, addresses in our area did not respond. Mm -hmm. uh, so you take that 15%, you multiply that by our 2010 population, which was 5184, 15% not responding. Our population could have been around 5,900. And that's something people don't think about. You know, 5,000 is the city status, and everybody wants to keep that. Yeah. Uh, that's good for your fundings. But I've also found, talking to the library, uh, that the library, they get their funds from the federal government, which goes to the state, and then they dole it out based on population. So they'll look at Belmont County's population. Everybody loves libraries. But if people aren't responding to the census, guess what? Our population is lower than maybe what it is, what it should be, and we get uh, less funding. And that's not good for the libraries or for our young people or anybody who's interested in libraries. So yeah, well, that makes a good point. And uh, you know, I think a, an example that might be uh, relevant to this is we lost two hospitals recently. Yes, and that's what it's about. There are not enough people going yeah. to those hospitals to pay the bills. Right. If you had a population in the six. 1960s, the Ohio Valley might have been a few hundred thousand people, and now it maybe is a hundred thousand if we're uh, lucky. Uh, you know, that just goes to show you, you know, industry is going to leave of a certain kind, and, and uh, we just saw that recently with the health care. Yeah, that, that makes a big difference. Um, so what do uh, citizens have to do in terms of with the census and that? Is it, what oh, yeah, it's a, actually very simple. Uh, this is the first year that they're kind of doing a lot of the census between May 12th and 20th, uh, all residential addresses in the United States uh, will get a notice from the Census Bureau and it'll say, hey, here's a link to our website, fill out our census form. There's only nine questions on the census form uh, this year, so it's, it's very easy and there are simple questions. I even brought the, uh, some of the questions here with us. They start out with how many people are living in your house? Simple enough answer. Um, were there additional people living in your house? Is this your house, apartment, mobile home? You know, what's your telephone number? And that, people have brought the, well, that's kind of a private question. If you go online now, and you probably know this, Bob, mm -hmm. and you would type my name in or your name in, guess what? Everything that's in here is already online. Yes. So it's not <laughs> like it's information that no one, that is that private. Um, they do ask about the sex of the people living in your home. They ask about the ethnic background. Uh, so it's all just basic questions. I bet you in a half hour, if your traditional home is four people and the head of the household fills it out, it would take them maybe a half hour to fill out the entire form. And it is St. Clairsville. We have a website, www.stclairsville.com, and there's a census link. And it has this uh, informational questionnaire on it, and that's what you'll see when you get online uh, with the census. So you'll, you could review it on our site, know what you have to fill out, and Instead of a half hour, have it filled out in 15 minutes. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it's www.stclairsville.com. Www I and, want to make sure people get that. Yeah, and you can also search any search engine, just the city of St. Clairsville, and you can find our homepage that way also. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Do you have anything else to offer to, to uh, tell us about? Well, I just encourage people to get out there. You know, when you get that notice in the mail, hop online, fill it out. If you don't have a computer, uh, the library has resources for you. Uh, our city council is what's considered our complete count committee. Uh, I've been working with them at the different uh, council meetings just saying, hey, get out there, knock on the doors of your neighbors. Uh, if you have elderly neighbors or people who maybe you think might not fill it out, just say, give them the reasons on why it's a positive to do that. Right. And uh, the higher the number, the, the better off we all are. So. Well, great, Tom. All right, Bob, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, and well, thank you for you coming in. Me. This has been very informative for me. And this has been today's History Upper Ohio Valley. I'm your host, Bob Connors, and we will see you next time. Welcome to today's History Upper Ohio Valley. I'm your host, Bob Connors. And I was wondering um, whether you, to let, I wanted to ask you, 
Whether you like or dislike President Trump, his accomplishments are helping millions of people all across the country. And the thought, the thought occurred to me that what if Hillary Clinton would have won? What would it be like then? Well, let's go through some of the things that we know have happened and didn't happen. What if Hillary Clinton had won the 2016 election? Two more Ruth Bader Ginsburg type judges would be on the Supreme Court. Why is that significant? Because Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg has repeatedly said she doesn't like our Constitution. Now, if you have a Supreme Court justice who does not like the Constitution that she is supposed to protect, do you think she will really protect it? I think not. I think she will protect it the way Peter Strzok protected the American people as an FBI agent. Our economy would not be the best it is in 50 years. Incomes would not be rising and the job numbers would not be anywhere near this historic level and all groups of people and sub um, economic groups have increased in income. That would not have happened. Our culture would not be recognizable and abortion would explode even after delivery uh, as Virginia governor has endorsed after delivery. Men would be in the ladies room and people would be required to misuse pronouns teaching kids that they can change their gender. And that's happening right now. No one would know anything about the widespread corruption that we're seeing unfold in Washington, D.C. right now. Socialism would surely be implemented to the point of no return. And once socialism is implemented, you cannot go back to the republic that we have you will be there until it collapses, which has happened historically in every country that socialism has been implemented. And we would not have the economy we have now. Trade deals would not have happened at all. We just had China, phase one, and U.S., Canada, and Mexican deal. That wouldn't have happened. Well, why is that important? Because those trade deals will dictate much of our economy for decades to come. It means jobs all over the place in many different fashions. Farmers are going to get, as an example from the China Phase 1 China deal, they will be getting this year, this fiscal year right now, $11 billion worth of sales. Next year, it will reach up close to $20 billion. Now, that would not be happening if not having the president we have. The southern border would be wide open, and that is undeniable. There would be no ban on travel from countries where they have no security vetting system. And that's a very big one because countries that have no security vetting system have bad guys get on those planes because nobody's looking at who they are and make it their way to America and they want to harm us and kill us. So that would not be happening. Jerusalem would not be the capital of Israel. And we would not be energy independent. And guess what? Right here in the Ohio Valley, the oil and gas industry would not be booming like it is. And the coal mines would be probably closed by now because Hillary Clinton said she was going to close down the coal mines, all of them. So all of the jobs there and all of the companies and businesses that feed the coal mine uh, industry would all be gone. So we would shrink down to nothing as an economy. So I thought that was an interesting thing to look at. Government would also have taken over your health care and be making decisions on whether or not you can have a heart surgery or the, whatever your doctor says. So those just thoughts for uh, the day. I'm your host, Bob Connors, today's History Upper Ohio Valley, and we will see you next time.